seriously. So, hey, I'm curious. Uh, if you, maybe you hadn't signed up yet, you're going to. Maybe you're going you're to dive in, even just hearing about this right now. How many of y'all are reading through the Bible right now? Raise your hand. Awesome. Incredible. And the, and the videos are so helpful along the way. I love what the crew has put together. So I hope that you're doing that, gang. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't know why. Seriously, if you're a member of this church, uh, if you're a believer, join us. But if you're a member of this church, I don't know why you wouldn't be doing this right now. I'm just saying. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a leader, if you're a deacon, connect group leader, you're talking about this because the way that we follow Jesus every day, which is the end, the, the, you know, the, the end game of our mission here together, is to walk with him through his word. Last week, we talked about, out of Genesis 3, what's happened in our world. You know, with all the questions that we see in Genesis, and the minute you start, you know, dive into the book of Genesis, you go, man, uh, wow, lots of questions about how, did, how was it created? Was it seven days? Was it, you know, all that kind of stuff. Did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? Were they, you know, where did, all this kind of stuff. And um, we had an incredible conference, by the way, this weekend on science and faith. We had over a thousand people here who were wrestling with those kinds of questions because there are answers. But the point is not so much how did this happen. It's that, but Why? That's the point of all the book of Genesis and from the very start. And when we start to see this is why the world is the way it is. After all is said and done, here's what I say about the scriptures. The first few chapters of Genesis and all the Bible. It is true. It's true. Had a fascinating conversation this week with an SMU student uh, for a couple of hours. Um, About this, really. Uh, he, He was kind of trying to figure out what what is guiding his life and, and, and how will he live his life. And we got into what we talked about last week, that, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil really is about, will I decide what's right and wrong or will God decide? See, Adam and Eve taking of the fruit, that was the, their way of saying, we will decide what's good and evil. I will decide what's right or wrong, right? And then we're going to see where life goes. When we step out of the truth of God, all right, allowing him to say, this is what's true about you and about your life. I will guide you. They're in perfect fellowship with him in the garden. They decide, uh, no, God gives us free will because okay, uh, true love is chosen love. And then they step away. They do what every one of us would have done. And so I'm talking to this young man. And in essence, uh, he, he's telling me, you know, here's, here's how... Kind of, I see life. I mean, I, I, I think you just try to do good. You try to establish what you think is right and wrong. Ultimately, all of us are moving towards happiness, right? Kind of the goal for most, you know, kind of the secular mind. Uh, happiness is the goal in life. And the way to get there is the pathway is freedom. I'll do whatever I want to do to make me happy. That's how most people live their lives. Here's, here's the gospel of the secular world in the modern West. You do you. I'll do me. You do you. Let me ask you, how is that going for us? How's that going for you? If you live that way. Because the Bible says, this is what's wild. What we call freedom, the early apprentices of Jesus, people like Paul and others, Christ himself, what we call freedom, the Bible calls slavery. What we call, we think is life and happiness, the Bible calls death. Why is that? Because the only way to live is within the framework that God has given us, according to his truth. Satan steps in, he always puts a lie in your mind, and then a lie becomes this challenge within us, our disordered desires. It's what Augustine called uh, love out of order. That's what he descri- how do you, he describes sin. Not God first, me first. And in a strange way, this sounds weird. Not going to worship God, going to worship myself. That's who I'll worship. And so a lie planted in our minds leads to our disordered desires that then becomes just normalized in a sinful society. We call it culture. And so the early followers of Jesus, they talked about the devil, right? The flesh and the world. Coming at us, Genesis 3 tells us why the world is the way it is. And so today we're going to see what happens when sin goes viral. All right? So turn in your Bible to Genesis 4, and we're going to see now the first uh, family that uh, is coming out out from Adam and Eve. 
And um, here's what I want to do before we actually look at the text. I've done a lot of thinking about this, so I want to get your, your minds thinking about it. Uh, we're going to look at some genealogies today. You know, sometimes you get in the scripture and you go, wow, he begat him, he begat him, and he begat that guy. And I'm going to show you how to read. Now, this one has some more details in it, but why are the genealogies there? They're there for a purpose. Um, and uh, so I started to think about my own family. I want you to think about yours. Uh, and, and I had to admit, Stacy and I were talking about this, I can't go much past my, gr- my grandfather, like grandparents. I, I called my mom yesterday, literally. Tell me, like, I've heard some story, like, what, who, where did we come from? What's, you know, beyond a couple of generations. Now, that's kind of humbling, is it not? Two generations away, people aren't going to remember you. Not even in your own family, they're not going to remember you. Now, that can either, dang, or where all this is heading starts with you, and it starts today. He's called us to worship him. We're going to talk about the purpose of the family, but I want to talk about households, okay? So if you're single, if you are living with others, if you have a roommate, you know, all that kind of thing, God has called us to worship him. And so I, I do know this. I have an uncle who's real into genealogies, and, um, and this is actually in the law. You can find this online. But we actually, there's a Richard Warren who was on the Mayflower, all right? That's our, those are my people, all right? My people got here before your people, um, probably, unless you're Native American. We, um, we were like the first immigrants is who we were. Um, you were, right? Many of us, many of us were. But all of us have, you go back a little bit, and you don't have to go back too far. You probably just go back to Christmas and like, yeah, I got, I got the crazy uncle, the jacked up aunt, and then there's that line of the family that's just crazy. And, uh, and, and now, here you are, okay? Regardless of what your story is, here you are. So the impact on my life, my grandfather on my dad's side, uh, we called him Pop-Pop, Pop-Pop and Nana. And Pop-Pop was a pastor, and some of you know, crazy story, don't have time to go into it, but in 1957, he preached in our sanctuary here at the dedication of this sanctuary. I wasn't even born yet. I was, and I grew up in North Carolina. How crazy is that? But he had an impact on my life. He literally led me to Christ in his house with my dad. My grandfather on my mom's side, I never met. Didn't even know him. Because he left my grandmother. He went to the Navy, came back, and left my grandmother with three little girls. My mom's one of them. And he never said bye, never said a word to his girls. He's gone. She says, 25 years later, he reached out to her and said, I'm sorry. By then, the impact on that family, you can imagine, right? And so two generations, two lines coming into my, my life. Praise God, my mom is, has been, had the most impact on my life, the most godly woman I've ever known. Got a text from her this morning. She's telling me about how amazing Jesus is and how she's teaching this to these women today in her Sunday school class. And she has continues to impact my life. And you're, I, mean, I got you thinking now about people in your own life. And maybe you say, Jeff, I don't have that kind of heritage. I, I'm, I mean, mine is, I'm the one person now. I don't have godly influence in my life. Praise God, you're the difference maker. You're the change that God is calling you to make. And, and I'm calling others of us to make. And so here's what I want to see. In this, um, in this passage... Genesis 4, we're going to see what the purpose of the family really is. And it comes down to this, all right, spoiler alert. Too often, we believe that the purpose of the family is to worship ourselves. Again, sounds strange, but we're going to see how it happens. But the purpose of the family is to worship God in faith. And we're going to see two lines that are going to play out, and we're going to see how generations are impacted. So I'm going to jump back to the first part of this passage, but let me just give you uh, kind of an update. You're right out of the garden, okay, Genesis 3, the fall. And then in, in chapter 4, Adam knew Eve, all right, that's another, we know what's up with that. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man. That word there is, it's interesting, man child. I got me a man child. Um, and this is like Zion Williamson, I mean, for Duke, he's a man child, all right? With the help of the Lord, and again, she bore his brother Abel. Okay, so now, many of you know the story. Now, this is the first family, all right? Adam and Eve, two sons, and you know now where this goes. There's this um, moment of worship. They both come to God. 
We'll come back to this. Cain gives God a little something. Abel gives God his first among his fattest of his livestock. He gives God his best is what he's saying there. Cain's uh, offering is not accepted. His worship is not accepted. Watch this. Two types of worship is what this comes down to. This is a sermon within a sermon. We can talk all about worship. People, we, we always want to talk about music. We want to talk about is it contemporary? Is it traditional? Is it, is it liturgical? Is it, is it beat me down? <laughs> Two types of worship in the Bible. Acceptable and unacceptable. That's it. Because it starts in the heart. And it's possible to come here today and to sing songs and not worship God. Because you're not singing from your heart to him. And so what we see with Cain, watch this. One line, we're going to see the Cain line go. And we'll see where that goes. Southbound, gravitational pull towards all that is sinful and wrong in the world. And then Abel, of course, he's killed by Cain. Because Cain's his offering not accepted. He's envious. Sin is crouching at his door. And then, then he, this sin rules over him. He kills his brother. First murder now. And then he's a fugitive. But what we're going to see is now he, and he's sent out. He's marked, by the way. We don't know if it's a tattoo. We don't know what this is. Um, but he is marked somehow by the grace of God so that others won't come after him. And so he'll be protected by God in essence. And so this is the first part of, of the story. And, and we see here that there's a line of Cain, so a Cainite line. And what we're going to do, we're going to see this now. We're going to watch Cain's line. And then Adam and Eve have another son. Anybody know his name? His name is Seth. His name is Seth, is the, is the son to come. So you have a Sethite line. Those are the two lines I want to look at, all right? So uh, Genesis chapter 4, uh, beginning with really verse 17, and here's what I want you to see. The, the purpose of the family. First of all, too often, the purpose of the family is, to, is self-worship. Again, that sounds strange, but we pick up the story in verse 17. Now watch this. Here's what happens. Cain knew his wife. Again, there it is. And she conceived and bore Enoch. Now, you're going to see two names here, Lamech and Enoch. And they're two different, two different people. All right, later on, we're going to see another Enoch. We're going to see another Lamech. They, they just didn't have enough names you know, to choose from, I guess. <laughs> and uh, by the way, this passage here, any expectant parents? Anybody? Any expecting? Okay, if you're expecting um, some children to come along, great passage to draw some names from. I'm just saying. <laughs> just watch. <laughs> Watch this. Um, Cain knew his wife. Okay, so when he built the city, he called this, the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Uh, to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered Mahujael. Mahujael fathered Methuselah. Methuselah fathered Lamech. We're five generations away from Adam. We come to Lamech, and there's a pause in the story and a little more detail about this guy because he is jacked up. I don't mean, I don't mean like bowed up, jacked up. I mean, he's messed up. Violence is all over this man, and he is far from God, following the impact, the influence of, of Cain. And Lamech took two wives, first mention of uh, polygamy in the Bible. The name of the one was Ada, and the, uh, and, the, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of those, watch this, who dwelt in tents and have livestock. We're going to see the real innovation here. You, this is where this, this kind of comes from. His brother's, uh, his brother's name was Jubal. Is he another great name for a boy? No, don't do that. He was the father of all who play the, the, the lyre and the pipe. So the, the musicians now, we see this. Uh, nobody, if you go to any university, any school of music, and say, hey, who, who invented music? Nobody would say Jubal. Um, Lamexon. That's who invented me. Nobody would say that unless you're in a really nerdy seminary class, maybe. But here it is. So, and then it goes on. Zilla also bore Tubal Cain, a great name. He was the, we're going to get to Jethro in a little while, but the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. So he's a, he's a manufacturer, he's a businessman. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama, or, or, or Nama, ne, ne, yeah. And so you, you can see here, that they all kinds of innovation, all kinds of great stuff going on. I mean, essentially, he has a, he has a rancher. He got like a pop star, and he has like a manufacturer, a businessman. So Lamech, so lots of good stuff, but he does not teach them how to worship God. In fact, he teaches them the opposite. Look at verse 23. 
Lamech said to his wives, now watch this. Here's a song that he's singing. Ada and Zilla, Zilla, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge was sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. He's pounding his chest. He's proclaiming how great, how violent he is. And he's celebrating his sin. I want you to see this. Too often the purpose of the family is self-worship. And the first thing I want you to see is we worship self-sufficiency. We see this in the text. So Cain gets exiled. And instead of seeking God for his safety and security, he, 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 he in, instead decides he's going to just, um, just hole up. He's going to build a wall. He's going to build a city. He's going to hide out. Does he trust God? No, he trusts his own self-sufficiency for protection. Because see, to be on his own, this was the curse. If he's on his own, he's susceptible. He's out there. He might be killed. He, he, he is, he's open. He's vulnerable. But he does not turn to God. And we know this by the way he lives, but we also know it right away. He builds a city, and what does he do? He names it after who? He names it after his son, Enoch. Now, you might say, that's cute. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's a lean towards, it's a push towards immortality. It's self-promoting. He becomes a paranoid hermit is what he does. He's hiding out, and we do the same. You and I, we build walls around ourselves. Think about it personally. We talked about it last week. You know, uh, Adam and Eve, the, a moment that they fall into sin before God, they start to cover themselves up with created things. They, they cover themselves up because of shame. And we do the same. We do it in our relationships. We talked about it last week. Last week, we, instead of, of, of really um, bringing our sin and our weakness into the light, we, we try to hide it. And I just want to remind you again, friends, sin grows in the dark. You bring it into the light. It's exposed you talk about our weaknesses. Instead, he, he, he's self-promoting. He, he's self-sufficient. And he says, no, no, no. And we talked about last week that, that uh, really social media now has become this digital fig leaf. We hide behind this certain image of ourselves, self-sufficient, promoting ourselves. We do the same. We applaud people uh, who are self-made. We use, we use the word self-taught, self you know, help, we, t- we call it. And we applaud people like that. And so I just want to speak to parents, all of us. You know, are we teaching our kids that they are awesome? Yes. That they're amazing, that they can do great things. They need to take care of themselves. But are we teaching them that their highest achievement is to be totally independent? Many men grow up that way. That to be a man is to just be totally independent from everybody else. The most courageous men among us are those who will share and talk about their weakness. Jesus taught us that. And so the most courageous ones among us are those who know. The Bible, Scripture never says, hide your junk. It says the opposite. Confess your sins to one another. We need help. Don't build walls around you. Are you teaching? Is your family kind of driven? Do you, I know some of us have literal walls around us, um, and, and yet God has, has taught us that we've got to share our weaknesses. Look at this next point I want you to see. We, we worship self-glorification. Again, he's five generations in, and now he's already promoting. He's bragging, you could argue, about his kids, and we do the same. If you want to know if you are self-glorifying, if you're teaching your kids to do the same, just listen to your brags. And again, social media has become this platform. You know, my daughter made it into High Horse Academy. (laughs) And I just work it into the conversation. You know, my son got that promotion. Just listen to how you promote your children, and promote your family because we seek to glorify ourselves. And what happens is we're teaching our children, invariably we're teaching them that life is about collecting trophies and not about making disciples and giving glory to God. See, the the family is, is the discipleship group that God has ordained for us to raise our kids to worship, not ourselves, but to worship Him. So look at this next point. We worship self-preservation. Lamech's song of swords is what some have titled it. He brags in front of his wives about killing somebody who just messed with him. And he's standing over 
gloating over the body of someone he's killed. This violent man. And we have so redefined manhood in our culture today. I couldn't help but think about Gaston's song in Beauty and the Beast. Do you remember this? No one slick as Gaston. No one hits like Gaston. And one, oh, in a spitting contest, no one spits like Gaston. That's the only song I know that has ex- expectorating in it. I don't know another song that has that. So he's just, you know, I am awesome. And it's funny because we're like this. You know, I have antlers in all of my decorating. And he's just self-gloating, self-glorifying. And we laugh because that's at the heart of every man. It's where we tend to go. It's where Cain's family went, where Lamech was. And this is the opposite of what Christ calls us to. To a life of self-sacrifice, self-denial. So that in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says this. If anyone come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Taking up your cross daily means that in any moment, everywhere you go, there's the possibility that you will lay down your desires, lay down your your needs and your hopes for self-sufficiency, self-glorification, self-preservation. And you're going to say, no, 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 I'm I'm going to die to myself. It may happen today. Man, I sure would like to do this, but, you know, my wife might be in need. I'm, I'm going to do this so she can do that. I'm going to give up some time. I, I'm, I'm going to give this up so that others might flourish around me. And here's what we do, too. We all seek to preserve. And it's so insidious that we can act like, uh, I mean, but there's, there's reasons for not doing things. Like, we'll be generous up to a point. Well, I'm going to give, but is our giving, is it really sacrificial? Really? Because there's this self-preservation. And I'm, I'm going on a trip this summer, uh, taking a group to Africa. We're going to go. I'm, I'm going also to South Texas here in the spring. But many of you are going on mission trips. Many people, watch this, in our church are giving up vacation time, not only a day or two, but a week or longer in order to go and serve the Lord in other parts of the world. When's the last time you gave up, how about that, work time in order to serve others? You see? That can happen. And so we give of our time. That's the most important thing we have. That's that's the most valuable possession we have. But you know, self-preservation, it's insidious because there are good arguments against it. I mean, mean to say, no, it's not self-preservation. It's like the armor we put on, like Lamech was wearing, perhaps made by his own son. And we hide behind it. It's that comfort and safety seeking to protect us. Are you comfortable? Are you safe? Somebody said, uh, the safest place to be in the world is in the will of God. That's as far from anything biblical I can think of. That's the craziest thing ever. When Paul was, was, was in, going through tribulation, when he was being persecuted, he said, you know what? I've, I've, I've been lashed this many times. I've gone through this. People are coming after me. The devil's coming after me. He's against me. I must be in the center of God's will. Safest place to be in the will of God. We need to teach our kids that if you're going to follow God, that it's going to cost you, and it just might cost you everything that you have. And so let's turn the corner. The purpose of the family instead is to worship in faith. All right, real simply. Praise God we don't stop with Cain. Fortunately, the tree fork splits. I almost titled this message, The Splitting of the Family Tree. The tree splits, and we move from self-sufficiency, glorification, and preservation to now the real purpose of the family. And here it is. How do we worship God in our family? Well, first we see that we worship by being dependent. Okay, look at the text. I'm going to show you this. And I've intentionally, I've not put the the scripture on the screen. I want you to bring your Bible every week. Bring bring the word of God with you. Because look at what happens. In verse 25, uh, chapter 4, verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again. They give birth to a son, another son, Seth. Uh, God's appointed me. He's given me another son because uh, Abel was killed by Cain. And then to Seth also was born a son, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, check it out, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. I want you to note, Enosh, that name means weakness. Who names their kid weakness? Except somebody who says, I want my son every day of his life 
to remember. It's not how awesome he is. If he's going to do anything great in life, it's going to be because he will be completely dependent on God because apart from God, he can do nothing. He is weak. He's going to call upon the name of the Lord, and this is exactly what we see happening. So the first thing I want you to see, we worship by being dependent on God. Are you dependent on him? You see, here's what's going to happen. Seth's line is going to provide men and women who ultimately... Uh, it, their, their line will, will culminate in the person of Jesus. Where this is heading is Noah at the end of chapter 5, a man who was calling after God. But in verse 26, a little boy named Enosh is born, and he's going to be reminded to be fully dependent upon God. And we see that he is. Are you dependent on him? Are you teaching your children to de- be dependent on him? Again, are you, are you, yes, telling your kids they're capable, they're wonderful, they're awesome, they're all that. You is kind, you is smart, you, you know, whatever you're telling them is all good. But are you also teaching them that they are fragile, incredibly desperate for God? Are you modeling this for them? I mean, we should... You want to cross stitch a verse? How about 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10? Paul said, My grace is sufficient for you. This is what he heard from the Lord, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then look at what Paul does. Parents, when's the last time you, you did this? Instead of beating your chest, boasting, gloating about how awesome you are and what you've done, he says, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is the way of the kingdom, friends. Listen to this. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I declare that I'm weak, the power of God comes upon my life. Have you seen this in the lives of others? You know, sometimes it takes the second half of life to learn this. But we can model it for our children. Listen, when you face marital problems, let me ask you, do you go to the latest self-help book? You you, you calling out for somebody on television to help? Or or do you go straight to God and say, Lord, I'm desperate for you? When you're challenged by that strong-willed child, are are you trying to just exert your will on them until you break them? Or are you saying, God, I need your help. I need your counsel. I need your wisdom. I need your grace and patience. God, I need your power in my life. See, the the easy metric is prayer. Are you praying? Do you pray? Do you call out for God or do you just, you know, kind of buckle up and and just get after it? You're self-focused. God's called us to teach our kids by modeling the way. And so, so he's calling us to be courageous. And courageous people are those who rely on God. Next thing I want you to see is this. We worship by, by being intimate. We, we worship by being intimate with God. Look at this. I love where this story goes. Watch what happens. So as we press on into the genealogy, the, in chapter 5, it, it, it goes back to Adam. Then, it, then there's this, you know, Cain is kind of kind of forgotten in essence, though he's done some great damage. Then there's Seth. And then what happens as you look into the, uh, the rest of chapter 5, Kenan uh, lived 70 years. He has my... Uh, Mahalalel, and then uh, Mahalalel uh, has Jared. Jared started like jewelry stores, and then you had Enoch. I made, I made that part up. See if you're tracking with me. J- um, Jared has Enoch. This is another Enoch. Enoch then has uh, Methuselah. Methuselah, what, what's his mark? He, he's the guy who lived the longest of anybody. Um, I mean, you see this over and over again. There's this drum that's beating throughout this passage, and this guy lived, and he died. Then he died. This guy lived, he bore a son, and he died. This guy lived, he bore a son, and he died. Enoch lived, he walked with God, and then God took him up. And what we see is a man who now has walked so intimately with God that he didn't take, taste death. I'm telling you, when I read this, I've read it before, but when I read it this week, I thought, that's what I want my epitaph to be. Isn't this what you want your epitaph to be? Think about it. He walked with God. Walked with God. Jeff walked with God. She walked with God. That's all that life is about. Worshiping him, walking with God every step of the way. He was so rooted in faith because of the influence of the Sethite line. 
that he ends up walking with God. And what's ironic about this, Enoch lives the shortest amount of time of any of Seth's ancestors, and yet he, the quality of his life outweighed the quantity of his life, and so close to God, he just said, okay, I'm going to just take you on with me. Friends, this is why this year the Bible is so important. It's why we seek to walk together in our connect groups together. It's why we're starting these men's groups that many of you men need to get in. To be honest, it'd be the most courageous thing you've done in years. And on February the 2nd, we're going to gather together. I'll be there and we're leading men. We're going to challenge men on a Saturday morning. You come and join us, every man. And we're going to be uh, getting in groups together for this semester. Uh, about a six-week study together. We're, we're, we're talking about what it means to be a man. All right? Just come on that morning. Even if you're not going to get in groups, come. It's going to be incredible. But I want you to see this last point, and then we'll challenge towards close. We're going to get to sing a song before we head out together, proclaiming what, what our reaction will be to this message. The next is we worship by being expectant. Now, here's what happens. In the last part of chapter 5, we go from Lamech all the way then to the last part of this chapter. There's another Lamech who comes along. Lamech. And he is, watch this, he's the father of Noah. Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, he's going to bring relief. Noah is this, this man of hope. Could it be that the curse is going to be reversed by bringing us back to the garden? And you see this over and over again in Scripture. Is it going to be Seth? Is it going to be Enoch? Is it going to be Noah? Is it going to be Abraham? Is it, and, and if you've been reading along with us, you're like, yeah, Abraham, he's awesome, and, until he's not, right? And then you got Isaac. Isaac's going to be the man. Nope, he's not. Jacob, jacked up, all right? Israel was his name. He named his, he named his people after him. It's because, look at this. Everybody in the Bible is messed up. And God uses messed up people because that's all he's got. The Bible is about him. It's not about us. It's not about a great man. It's about a great God. And though Noah brings the promise that ultimately is going to culminate in the person of Jesus, we see that he remains expectant. The Sethite line allows us to be hopeful. Noah means, watch this, Noah means rest. Isn't that what you need today? More than anything in your life, peace. And through Noah, we're going to see that the world is going to get darker and darker. I mean, it is like, it's today. We got politicians fighting. We got a government in partial shutdown. We got races fighting. We got nations waging wars against nations. We can't even get along with each other. And so, but I want to ask, are you hopeful? Believers should be the most hopeful people on the planet. God tells us in Genesis 1, 28, be fruitful and multiply. And then he says in Matthew 28, verse 19, go. Be fruitful and multiply. Make disciples. In the home, your relationships is where that happens. We've been called to worship God. So here's where this lands. It starts with you. It starts with you. How is it that we're going to impact generations to come? It starts with you. It started with Cain. We see where that goes. Look at this. It starts with your heart. Are you a worshiper of God? Do you worship him? Not only when you come here, but when you leave here, are you going to worship him all week long? Are you going to walk with him through his word? Are you going to listen to him and not a million other voices? Cain brought a little something to God. Some of us come on Sunday mornings. I'm going to bring a little something. And his heart was not in it. And his worship was not acceptable. Praise be to God. Christ has come to forgive us of our sins. Made a way for us to worship God so that we are accepted before him. Not because of our righteousness, but because of his. So we can worship him. It starts with your heart. But listen, it starts with your response. I'm going to challenge you to do something. Do something. What are you going to do? Because we all find ourselves east of Eden. We live in this dark world, and the world is watching for one man, one woman, one family, one young person who will say, I'm going to worship God. Nobody else around me is going to worship him. I will worship him. 
And so what I want us to do is to, we thought it'd be so cool. We got time. Close our time by proclaiming that we will build our lives on him and him alone. So I want us to pray together. And I don't want you to be thinking about how you're going to rush out to go and, again, self-gratification, self-glorification, self-sufficient. I've got to figure out what I'm going to do for lunch. I've got to do that. Listen, I want you to focus your heart right now. And we have time to worship God. And we're going to proclaim that we will build our lives on Him and Him alone. This could be a moment that generations to come will be changed because of decisions made right now. Friend, if you've not received Christ as your Lord and Savior, I challenge you right now, there is no other hope. There's a better Seth coming. There's a better Noah coming. His name is Jesus, who comes to rescue us from our sin. Give him your life. And right now, wherever you are in your life, you might say, man, I've not, I've not been faithful. Today is the turning point. And you, you could say, wow, I, I've, been, I've been given a great gift of, of godly parents and, and influence in my life. What are you going to do with that, friend? Or maybe you're the first in a long lineage of people, you're the first one who said, I will follow God. The heavens applaud you. God is watching. He's given you strength to live that life, to be the light that your family needs. I'm believing that dads in this room, fathers are going to step up, husbands, wives are going to step up today and say, I'll be that man. I'll be that woman. You see, throughout, it's, it's, it's the men. It's, it's a man. It's the men. And the man messes up. We need godly men. So I want us to proclaim what we believe, what we desire in our lives.